It's my pleasure to be here and brief you on the report. Um, I do want to start with a little disclaimer. Um, the, the report came out of my word processor, but it's the product of more than a year of work of our group of over 50 people, those nine co-chairs who Rachel talked about and the, and the 45 members. Um, their names are all on the last few pages of the report. I won't read them to you, but do look at them um, because you need to imagine these people standing behind and around me. This isn't my, this is, these aren't my words, these aren't my thoughts, this isn't my call to Washington. This is the product of a big group of Midwesterners. And they're Midwesterners from every different walk of life in the Midwest. We had the former mayor of Chicago, we had several former governors, we had immigrants' rights advocates, we had business leaders, we had representatives, we have, I shouldn't put it past tense, we have representatives of the region's great universities, uh, we have um, faith leaders, law enforcement, several small town mayors. So you can imagine the group um, that sat around this table for four long days uh, coming up with these recommendations uh, for Washington. So what I'm going to do as their representative this morning is, is three things. I'm going to talk briefly about the assumptions behind the report, why we did it, why we did exactly this, and why we did it now. I'm going to walk you briefly through some of the high points in the report, a couple of the standout uh, elements and standout numbers. And then I'm going to try to talk about some next steps and open it up to a conversation here. So the two assumptions behind the report, they're two important ones. Number one is that the Midwest has something distinctive to say about the immigration debate. I come from Washington. I spent the last 10 years in Washington trying to get immigration reform, trying to help make it happen. And I've been watching politicians in Washington try to deal with this for the past 10 years. Presidents have come and gone. Different presidents have tried. Democrats and Republicans have tried. The intensity of the debate rises and falls. But at this point, it's kind of like watching the reruns of a bad movie. We've seen it too many times, and the end is always disappointing. So one of the key assumptions behind this project is that it's time for people outside of Washington to lift up their voices and add their ideas to the debate. And frankly, to give the people in Washington a kick in the pants, people who haven't been able to solve it. And it's also part of this assumption behind, in the task force is that Midwesterners in, a, in particular are particularly well placed to say something about immigration and to, and to get the debate moving. Number one, Midwesterners are pragmatic. They're problem solvers. They have a long experience with immigration, as Governor Holden said, the Midwest has probably seen more immigration from more countries over a longer period than any region in the country. And the Midwest's recent experience of immigration is also distinct in many ways. Unlike some regions, the Midwest needs high-skilled immigrants, but it also needs less skilled immigrants to revitalize the workforce. Like, like most regions, it needs immigrants as workers, but it also needs them to help replenish a stagnant or, in some places, even dwindling population. And in the Midwest, I think there's an appreciation, unlike in some other regions, for the way immigrants are revitalizing towns and areas, bringing new life and energy and entrepreneurialism and good values. Not every region understands that or appreciates it, but I think in the Midwest, people, many people do. And so assumption number one behind the report is that the Midwest needs to raise its voice that you have a vital and unique contribution to the make to the immigration debate, and it needs to, it needs to, that voice needs to be added to the debate. The second point, and I think you all understand this from the discussion I've heard already here this morning, but the second assumption behind the report is that we're, is that we're making the argument from competitiveness. There are many ways that the immigration system is broken in many ways, right? Um, and there are many different reasons to fix it. Some people come to it for moral reasons. Some people come to it for human reasons. Some people come to it for fairness reasons, or security reasons, or rule of law reasons, or foreign policy reasons. There are lots of reasons to care about immigration. But, and whatever your values, there are many ways that the broken system is, is 
is getting in your way or, or infringing on your priority, priorities. But the assumption behind this report is that we need to, as Americans and as Midwesterners, we need to talk more about the way the broken system is hurting the American economy, how it's holding back our economic growth how it's depriving us of skilled workers and entrepreneurs, how it's putting us at a disadvantage compared to our com to competitor countries, how it's slowing our job growth and limiting our productivity. And as you know, many people in the Midwest and elsewhere, many people who aren't educated about the issue, believe that immigrants steal jobs from Americans or that, they, that, they, that they're an economic drain. And, and the point about the, uh, the, the assumption behind this report and the point we're trying to make is that that's exactly wrong, that the exact opposite is true, that immigrants create jobs and enhance American productivity and help businesses stay healthy and contribute to the economy. So those are our two assumptions. Uh, Midwest has a voice and that we need to argue it from an economic competitiveness point of view. So briefly, let me go through, a little, tell you a little bit about what's in the report. It's jam-packed with interesting stuff, and I do urge you to look at it carefully. We, um, we do have some politics of immigration. We do have a little bit on the moral case for immigration. We do have some history of immigration in the Midwest. But as I say, the important point that we come down to is the economic point, the competitiveness. And we're talking about both highly skilled workers, right? Everyone gets, a lot more pe many people get that. Um, you know, the guy who invented the Pentium chip, that might be good for America. Um, we're also making a point about less skilled workers, right? About people who are willing to work on farms, and people who are willing to be home health care aides, people who are willing to work in, in food processing plants. So a couple of numbers, just to throw out some of the, some of the highlights. According to the Indiana-based Lumina Foundation, the United States will not remain a globally, globally competitive unless 60% of the people living here have post-secondary degrees by 2025. 60%. Well, right now, only 38% of Americans have post-secondary degrees. And the point is, immigrants can help us with that. We need to be educating more Americans, but if we can bring some immigrants with, with post-secondary degrees, that's going to help us bring that number up. Another number from a different part of the economy. A, tw a 2011 survey by Deloitte and the National Association of Manufacturers found that even in 2011, when the US was at 9% unemployment, manufacturing companies couldn't fill 600,000 high-skill manufacturing positions, even when there was 9% unemployment. Immigrants can help with that. Immigrants can help us fill those jobs. Again, another part of the economy. We've talked, we thought about very high skilled, medium skilled. In 1960, half of all the, 1960, not very long ago, right? In 1960, half of the American men, American born men in the US workforce had dropped out of high school and were looking for unskilled work, half. Well, today, how many US born men in the workforce have dropped out of high school? It's less than 10%. But we still need people actually to do unskilled jobs. We still need farm workers and, and, and hospitality workers and food processing workers. Immigrants can help us with that. Another number, num fourth number, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the occupations that are going to grow fastest between 2010 and 2020 are home health care aides and personal care aides. And I don't know about how many of you, but ha how many of you think your children are going to do that or your neighbor's children? Not very many. Immigrants can help us with that. Finally, a last number, for decades, for most of my life, for m most of many of your lives, the U.S. was the destination of choice for foreign students. People who wanted to go to world-class universities came from all over the world. They often came to the Midwest, in fact. Uh, and then after when they graduated, they stayed to build careers. Well, today, according to a 2009 survey, of course, the, the students that are, people are still coming from all over, but Indians and Chinese are among the biggest groups and the ones that we're, those are the countries we're competing with most actively. 6% of the Indians studying in U.S. universities say they're going to stay after they graduate, 6%, and only 10% of the Chinese who are studying in U.S. universities say they're going to stay. And a big part of the reason is the broken immigration system and fixing the immigration system could help us significantly in keeping those people so that we don't educate them at our expense and then send them back to our competitors to help their build their economy. So. 
the, the, the point about the report is we've lifted up some of these numbers. We've made this case about the economy. Again, we also have some other pieces in there making the case about the politics and about the, the moral argument. But in the end, what we come down to, and the part of the report that I urge you to look at most carefully, are the recommendations at the end. And the recommendations are a little different than recommendations in some reports. Um, we don't actually recommend specific policy steps. You know, we thought about this long and hard, and we decided that immigration is a very technical issue, and in the end, the bill, the reform, is going to be a compromise between Democrats and Republicans, right? So, you know, th that's going to happen in, the, in, the, in some back room in the Senate. They're going to decide how exactly the policy should be put together. So that it didn't make sense for us necessarily to recommend exactly what the policy fix should be. But what, the, what we did want to do is, is talk about the pieces that the Midwest needs fixed. We wanted to lift up and present to the politicians in Washington, here are the eight things that we really need you to tackle. And so I urge you to look very carefully at pages 15 through 18. That's where we lift up those specific pieces. It's about skilled workers and unskilled workers and entrepreneurs. That's the part of the report. That's kind of the heart of the substance of the report. But the, before I, I, my t I'm running out of time, and so before I close, I want to draw your special attention to the conclusion of the report, where we make a really important point, we think, about the politics of immigration. And this is really, in some ways, the headline of the whole report. This is, you know, I think when they write up the stories, this is what they're going to focus on. Because, as, as all of you know, for many years, the rallying cry about immigration and about fixing the immigration system has been comprehensive immigration reform. And the goal, what we all meant by comprehensive immigration reform, was one big multi-dimensional package that had a little something for everyone. Something about enforcement, something about the unauthorized workers already here, something about fixing the legal immigration system, something about high-skilled, something about low-skilled. And the idea was put them all together in one package um, because it would be easier to pass one big package. And the hope was we would pass it all in one big fell swoop, a big grand bargain. I, won't, I was going to say like health care, maybe I shouldn't compare it to health care. Um, but the idea is one big omnibus bill. Um, and of the point we make in the report is that we do still need that. We do still need to fix all those different pieces. We can't leave any of them out, and we can't leave any particular group in there out, right? But, and this is really the important but, and this is kind of the headline of the report, if Congress can't find the will, if Congress can't figure out how to combine all those pieces in one package, and we're starting, after 10 years of trying, we're starting to think that maybe they can't, um, we'd like to see them start where they can. Fix the pieces that they can fix. Even if they have to start with some small pieces, we'd like to see them start to chip away at the list of what we need done. On the theory that you solve some of these smaller pieces, you take them off the table, you Democrats and Republicans learn to, to work better on some of those small pieces, and that will build them Hmm. <laughs> and that will build the momentum of its own. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I. <laughs> wow, that was really dramatic. That's ne never happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, I, somebody doesn't like that argument. <laughs> um, I knew it would be a, a controversial. Um, the point, the, what we argue in the report, and I think this is fresh and new, and again, I think this is kind of Midwest pragmatism coming to the fore. We're saying that we need all these pieces, but that if you can't do all the pieces together, start now and get, make the progress that you can make, that even some of these small steps, um, we believe, will lead to, will create momentum. And, you know, just get, go, again, the, the, the bottom line of the report is a kick in the pants to Congress. And we're saying if you can't do it all, it'll start where you can. So my time is up. I want, to, I want to do one more thing before I start, before I stop, which is really throw the ball back at all of you. Um, we're here today not just to explain this report, not just to tell you what we're doing. We're here to get your input. Um, the point is this is meant to be a report that comes from these nine co-chairs and the 45 members of the task force, but also 500 other people um, across the Midwest. And we're counting on many of you to be among that 500. And we want your feedback today. We're really here to get your input, to get your feedback. There's a region, there's a blank page in the report. That's because we want you to fill it in. We want to hear from you. We want to hear 
how you think immigration system is broken. We want to hear how you think it's holding back economic growth in your community and in your business. And we want to hear from you specifically what you think the government needs to fix. Um, with that, I'll be quiet and open the door to the other speakers. Thank you so much.